Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We've got a wonderful program today all about the Investments in Wealth Institute CIMA, the Certified Investment Management Analyst Program. If you're not familiar with Investments in Wealth Institute, we are a professional association, an advanced education provider, and a certification board. Uh, in addition to the SEMA program, we do have the CPWA and RMA designations. You can learn all about on our website. But let's dig into SEMA. With the SEMA, uh, this is uh, taking a look at this screen. Our members, our certificates, tell us that there's five big reasons that they work towards the SEMA designation. And certainly, uh, com competing in this very difficult market, finding ways to attract new clients, finding ways to do a good job for your role, whether you're in a corporate role or you're part of a team. How do you grow? in your practice? How do you grow in the success of your role, driving higher compensation for yourself and for your team, for your business? Um, being able to have more confidence with clients, being able to sit in those meetings with either prospects or clients, have a greater impact, add value, serve those clients better. And we do that, we believe, with expert instruction. You're going to get a taste of that today with our guest speaker um, uh, and relevant content, uh, all with our our job task analysis that we include to make sure that our exam, our content, all the things that you learn in the SEMA certification program, very applicable, very practical, give you things that you can use not only in your everyday life, but things that you could use with your practice and the role that you're in, all with driving better outcomes. And we believe that's a huge opportunity. If you want to dig deeper into the value of certifications, we have a wonderful document online uh, research that we work together with Cerulean Associates to drive. You can have access to that document uh, if you're curious on the impact of certification, this education process, these programs, why we have such a great passion for this, why we believe it makes such a big difference and has such a benefit for you and those that you serve. We've got a wonderful research piece that tells you all about that. So the SEMA certification, the Certified Investment Management analyst program has five pieces as you walk through this program you'll see fundamentals right starting with statistics and methods that applied finance and economics growing through and all the investment vehicles of those choices fixed income alternatives it could be all that piece real estate options futures you could imagine going through number three portfolio theory how do we build through that both theory and behavioral finance right understanding uh, where those investment philosophies styles those tools build into how you build great portfolios through your construction process. And number four, risk and return. What are the attributes of risk? How do we dig into performance measurement? All those things that you're gonna to need to understand behind the scenes, as well as how do we know those so well that we can communicate to the, our clients, that we can help them grow their confidence in our process, in our structure, in our systems that we have as portfolio managers, as advisors, as but maybe an internal wholesaler or a wholesaler representing an asset management company. And certainly number five, the, the, the culmination of all of these core topics where we can build great portfolios that drive what believe hopefully is better results and better outcomes through that consulting process, help your clients navigate both the, maybe the good and the bad times of the marketplace or maybe difficult times in their own portfolios where you can get through and have better results. We believe that SEMA sets you up to have those strengths uh, as a practitioner so you can deliver on that. We've got a wonderful program for you today that we're going to tell you all about the Chicago Booth SEMA Education Program. We've got a guest speaker on with us today, Kathleen Fitzgerald. Uh, Kathleen is known at the University of Chicago as a superb educator. She brings a remarkably wide array of experience as an educator and practitioner to the classroom. She's taught courses in accounting, investments, corporate finance, strategy, international finance, my goodness, and financial management, all the cool stuff. Kathleen also holds the position of Senior Director of Academic Support for the University of Chicago Booth School of Business in Chicago, London, and Hong Kong, in which she prepares students of Chicago Booth Executive MBA program for the rigors of Chicago's quantitative approach to finance, economics, statistics, and marketing. Could we ask for a better person to be on today's call, I don't think so. Kathleen graduated from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst with a bachelor's degree in economics. 
uh, an MBA as well. She passed her unified CPA examination in 1994 and holds a master's in business administration from the University of Chicago. Kathleen, welcome. I'm muted. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. I muted myself, sorry. Welcome uh, to everyone. Mike, thanks very much. That was very kind. I um, am happy to be here. I have been working with the SEMA program for a long time. Um, and I love working with IWI. I think this is an excellent certification. I probably have hundreds of alumni from our booth program that have gone on to do very well in their careers. I just lost my little pen. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show my screen and talk a little bit about performance measurement. Does that sound good? Mike, am I good to go? Sounds wonderful. If we can make your screen maybe full full size. I'm gonna, do that. I'm gonna make that full size. And I, I need to show my main screen anyway. And I'm gonna get rid of myself. That's very disconcerting. Um, but I'm here. I'm not leaving. Does everyone see my main screen? Yes, that looks wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and I got. I might ask you guys questions and ask for a quick response in the chat. Like Mike said, if you're asking him a question, you might want to put it in the question box. But if I ask you a question, if you see the chat, do you see that little feature? If you could just answer it there, that would be wonderful. Um, since we don't, we probably can't use audio at work. All right, so we're going to talk today about performance measurement, but one of the things I wanted to talk about before we started is something that Mike was talking about, um, because I'm a big believer in the SEMA curriculum. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the curriculum, then I'm definitely going to move over to the main purpose of this 30 minute or so talk, and um, 25. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the booth program in case you're out there exploring programs. I know that um, Yale and Wharton also have very good programs, but all of us have something that's just a little bit different. So I want to give you a little bit of information on the booth program in case what we offer is aligned with what the type of things that you're looking for in a program. So the first thing I want to talk about really is the curriculum. Um, you know, I've been working in MBA programs for a number of years and I think I'm a pretty good judge of when curriculum is aligned and when it just makes a lot of sense. And I, I do believe this makes a lot of sense. So if you could just bear with me, I know you know a little bit about it. In the percentages, you can see what percentage of the exam is for each of these five main areas. And the beauty of these areas is that they all really build upon each other. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna show you that today in our performance measurement. So the first thing you would have to learn, like in any kind of degree program, is your foundations. And because this is essentially an investment certificate, right, um, there are a lot of mathematical tools that you will need to understand and some economics tools. And this, to me, is crucial in you know, building what Mike was talking about, building confidence and being able to explain things to your clients. Because if you're grounded in the foundations and you understand where these, you know, where your recommendations are coming from, it, it, it really goes a long way to adding credibility for you and also making you uh, much more confident. So we'll talk about, in all of our programs, we talk about statistics, probability, um, time value of money, microeconomics, macroeconomics, and capital markets history. So the idea is that you have the foundations. Um, moving on from that, we're gonna apply those foundations by understanding the different types of investments that one can make. So the first section, investment vehicles, that's really about mutual funds, hedge funds, exchange traded funds, places that we put these separate investments. So these separate investments could be equity, it could be fixed income, alternative investments, options, futures, and other derivatives, and you'll learn about real assets. And for each of those things, we're going to learn things such as, you know, um, tax effects, right? How to be efficient. 
valuation. Um, how do we value those things? How do we know what they're worth? Um, correlation. What's the correlation between these types of assets? Like, how do they move together? Um, and of course, we'll want we'll learn about definitions. We'll learn about different types of risk associated with each type of investment, and you know, historical returns that have have occurred. So this is a so we learn the math, and then we learn what these vehicles are. Then the next thing that you're going to learn is how to put these all together. So how do we put everything together in a portfolio? And you know, we think about modern portfolio theory, which assumes that investors are all rational. Where and then we say, well, what about this other perspective? If we think about behavioral finance, where people may not always be rational, and the decisions they make may systematically affect, you know, outcomes. Um, even you know, if if they don't affect outcomes, just knowing about behavioral finance will help you later down the road when you're trying to advise your clients. Um, when we put our portfolios together, we're going to learn some other tools and strategies, right? So like we'll learn about technical analysis um, as opposed to fundamental analysis or believing in efficient markets. So we'll talk about these types of tools, which are covered on the certification exam. So it's quite important to understand technical analysis, at least to some degree. Um, different types of things like Monte Carlo, VAR, um, all different types of tools and strategies that help you think about your portfolios and how you put them together. And then really what's underlying the whole putting together of the portfolio, what's your investment philosophy and what type of style are you going for? So the, this box at the bottom is kind of going to guide you're putting the portfolio together in the first place. So we've got our foundations, we know what we're talking about. We've got our investments, we know all different aspects of all these different asset classes that we could be investing in. Then we go ahead and we learn how these things work together, right? Like when gold is paying off, what's happening to automobile stock, things like that. So we're understanding how they work together in a portfolio. Then what we want to be able to do is we need to be able to evaluate our portfolios. So this all kind of falls under this concept of performance measurement, which I'll be talking about today. Um, but on top of that, what are we measuring, right? So we have to understand risk and different measures of risk. We have to understand how returns are calculated in the first place. And then I would say, you know, there's really two aspects. There's kind of like appraisal. Did we do better than our benchmark? And then there's attribution, which is why did we do better, right? Or how did we do better? What choices did we make that allowed us to beat our benchmark? So this is, we'll do a very high level, obviously, um, overview of that today. And then the last thing, which I would say is probably the most important for you, and that's why it's 25% of the exam, is really putting these things together and the whole consulting process. So of course, you really will need to memorize, learn, live the code of professional responsibility because this is what gives, apart from the educational aspects of it, it gives SEMA its name, right? So everyone trusts a SEMA because you live by this code of professional responsibility. So this is something that all throughout the process, I would just always have it handy and just make sure that you're understanding all of these different things. But then in the consulting process itself, right? Thinking about who's your client, what's the right investment policy for them, writing an investment policy statement, determining for that particular individual what should this uh, portfolio look like how risk averse are they how willing are they take are they to take on risk how much risk can they take on what's their tax situation what is their stage of life right all of these different types of things that go into you forming the perfect portfolio or as close as you can for your clients and then finally you know figuring out who you're going to hire Right? Who are you going to hire to manage these portfolios? Where are you going to get your products? 
and then also periodically, you know, how, when should we review our portfolios? What should we be looking for? When do we make necessary revisions? So this curriculum is top notch, A plus curriculum. Um, it has a beautiful flow to it. I think that, you know, doing this is going to help you accomplish all of the goals and all of the benefits that Mike pointed out that prior and current um, SEMA certificates hold. Okay, so I, I hope that's clear. Um, it's not just throw something. I guess they don't, yeah, they can't see the chat. So I'm, a, I'm into the clients as well. Uh, but if you have any questions, just throw it in the chat and we'll answer them later. So let's think about performance measurement. And performance measurement is done for a number of reasons. You may have more reasons. I put a few up here. Um, number one, you wanna be able to assess your investment approach. So you came up with this strategy, you built the portfolio, How's it working out for you? Does it make sense? Is your client happy with it? Um, if not, or even if they are, are there changes that you can make to improve what you're doing? So this will give you a way to think about what changes could we make that would improve our outcomes? Um, it's a very good way to be able to sit down with your client, explain, you know, why are we looking at this performance measure? What does it mean? And why is it important? It should be important to you. And you know, it's often used for compensation as well. So you may have to compensate, you know, your managers are getting paid, or at least you're gonna uh, keep them or fire them if they're not doing a very good job. So it's ways of evaluating. So I'll say compensating or evaluating. Um, our managers. So either of the two. Okay. So what are the main questions that I would be asking if I were doing this? So I would be concerned with, on the appraisal side, this is more about did we underperform or did we overperform relative to our benchmark? So there's a couple of things in there, right? There's over or underperforming and there's also our benchmark. And then, like I said before, there's this attribution aspect. What are the sources? So is it something called asset allocation? So when we think of asset allocation, here we're thinking about, are we in the right asset classes at the right time? So was I in equity when equities were paying off or were I, was I in bonds, right? Was I overweighted in bonds? And then you also might think about security selection, which is within an asset class, did I pick the right securities? So they're very, two different questions. There's, much more advanced, I would imagine, attribution that you're doing. Most of it, I would say probably about 90% of the reason for over and under performance is coming from asset allocation. So, you know, bringing that, nailing that down, like filtering and filtering and filtering is probably just not worth the effort. Um, so we will focus on asset allocation and security selection in the program. Um, so let's, Let's go a little bit further, you know, what's a benchmark? So a benchmark is, you know, something to compare to. So this has to be a comparison. And we have to think about, well, what are some possible benchmarks, right? So you probably, in your mind, since I can't see what you're thinking, think about what some possible benchmarks might be. It might be, for example, a, mar a general market um index like the s p index it could be a portfolio of alternatives right it could be um any type of thing the problem is it, i mean the challenge is you have to choose the one that's aligned with what your goals are and then we're going to think about measuring performance so we said performance measurement is important right to be able to do these types of things. We're gonna try to decide whether we overperformed or underperformed our benchmark, and we're gonna try to figure out why. That means we need to understand what a benchmark is, what are some possibilities, how do we make the choice, and then how do we actually do the measurement? So types of benchmarks, this is, the focus today is not benchmarks, it's performance measurement, so I'm not gonna get too deep into these, but these are our possibilities. So absolute return, 
manager universes, so comparison against a bunch of other managers, something goals-based, um, broad market indices, so that's what I was talking about, the S&P 500, or some alternative market indices, or other, and that depends on your goals. So what are you trying to do? You need to find a benchmark that is doing the same thing. What are some characteristics? This is important to understand. It has to be unambiguous, right? You have to be able to really understand what this benchmark is measuring. You can't say, oh, we're just gonna look at some indices. No, I'm gonna look at the S&P 500 index over the same time period, right? Unambiguous, lay it out, write it in your investment policy statement. It has to be investable. So it has to be something that you can actually make the investments in. Um, you have to be able to measure the performance. It has to be compatible or appropriate. And what I mean is with your investment policy and style. So it just, if I'm doing, you know, investing in the market in general, I like got passive index fund, I'm not gonna compare it to an index of alternatives that doesn't make any sense and yes you cannot move the goalpost right you have to specify in advance of the determination period what exactly um, your benchmark is and this makes sense right I mean this is why when you take a course your syllabus tells you how you're going to be graded this is the same exact idea except for now you're being graded as an investment consultant and are you making the right the right decisions so then what performance measures should we use first of all we need to be able to calculate returns right so we need to be able to calculate a holding period return which is the return over the period so say like the return today is the price minus last period's price plus the dividend over the last period's price. So this is telling me what was my return over the holding period. I could look at an arithmetic return. So this could be, for example, the holding period return in one, the holding period return in period two, divided by two. That's a simple average. I could use a geometric return, which incorporates compounding. So this would be, for example, the nth root of one plus maybe the holding period return in one times one plus the holding period return in two times one plus the holding period return in period n. And then we take the nth root. So if it were just two period returns, let's say we had two period returns, holding period return in one, is 10%, holding period return in two is 12%. It's just, oops, minus one. It's just the square root, that's an ugly square root, sorry. That's 12. It would be 1.1 times 1.12 square root minus one. The minus one is outside of the square root. Or we could look at an internal rate of return. An internal rate of return, it's the rate at which the present value of the cash inflows equals the present value of the cash outflows. So those of you that have finance degrees, you know that's where the NPV, or you don't need a degree to know this, where the net present value is zero. So if I, for example, made an investment of 100 today, and I got in 50 a period for three periods, the internal rate of return is the one that makes 100 equal to those three things. I'm gonna get rid of that minus because that will confuse you. So if we make a $100 investment and we get 50 a year for three years, what was our rate of return? And in investment speak, this is often called the dollar weighted return. And this is called time weighted because we don't wait. It's just every time period return gets the same weight. So we've got dollar weighted, we've got 
time weighted. And what you'll learn in any CMAT education program are the pros and cons to each of these methods. What are the underlying assumptions? Who should use those? When should you use those with your client? When should you not, right? So the actual calculations, we can all do them. But the value added from doing the SEMA certification is understanding why. That makes you a savvy user of uh, you know, presented metrics by managers and others. You could use it in your own life. Uh, and it also makes you be able to explain to your client or enables you why you chose certain things, okay? Then, once we have our measures of return, we have to think about measures of performance. And there's a laundry list of performance measures. Sharp ratio, Sortino ratio, and trainer ratio, for example, those three are looking at a measure of reward per unit of risk. So that's saying for every incremental unit of risk that I take on, how much reward do I get? And what's different is the reward is always the same. It's always, well, since this is realized, I'm going to say return. That's the return on your portfolio minus the risk-free rate. So that's your excess return over your risk. If it's the sharp ratio, we use standard deviation. If it's the trainer ratio, we use beta. If it's the Sortino ratio, we use downside standard deviation. So we only care about negative bad outcomes. A low, well, outcomes I'll say below a minimum acceptable return. If we use alpha or Jensen's alpha, we're trying to see if we beat a benchmark. Alpha minus, alpha equals the return on your portfolio minus your benchmark. If we call it Jensen's alpha, what it means is it's the return on your portfolio minus what the CAPM expected return will be. So it just has a different and particular benchmark. We might look at information ratio. Information ratio says, what's my alpha over my tracking error? And this is a measure of luck or skill, right? And directly correlates to the sharp ratio. But the idea here is, if my alpha is big, I beat the benchmark by a lot. But my tracking error is also large. What does that really mean? Did I just get lucky? Because I didn't actually track what my benchmark was doing. So where's this alpha coming from? Alternatively, if I have a big alpha and a small tracking error, meaning that I, I tracked what I was supposed to track, then we would say that's a measure of skill. So that's called an information ratio. It's also called an appraisal ratio. And so we'll learn about that as well. M squared and R squared are a little bit more advanced that we would talk about those in class, but M squared is saying, you know, even if you beat the market, would you have beaten the market if you took on the same amount of risk as the market? So often, for example, we might have a return of 20, right? So that's our return, but our standard deviation was 40. Whereas the market only earned 15, but the standard deviation of the market, let's say, was 18. So could I really say that I beat the market or I beat my benchmark? Yeah, I beat them by 5%. But what did it cost me? I took on a huge amount of risk to do that. So we will learn about how to equalize these things. And then the R squared is telling me, it basically tells you explained variance as a percentage of total variance. And so this is saying my, the re return on my fund had this much variance, this much can be explained by variation in my benchmark fund. And if you're supposed to be tracking your benchmark, you would want that to be high, right? If your R squared is low, what are you really benchmarking, right? So like I said, there's a lots of measures that you can use um, and anyone can calculate a measure. Anyone can go into an Excel sheet, spreadsheet and make these calculations, but only people with knowledge can understand which measure to use at which time. 
what are the proper inputs, what are the proper benchmarks and comparisons to make, and then be able to explain it to your clients and to yourselves and to any significant other. I have a professor friend, he calls it the significant other test. If you can't explain this to someone that knows something about finance, you need to go back to the drawing board. And, and that's what you'll get with these types of certifications. You're gonna get the tools and the language needed to explain these things. Is that clear? I can't, I, I'm gonna assume you're saying yes. So one other thing, Mike, I think I'm just gonna go like four more minutes. Um, these things don't come out of a vacuum. Now, I told you that the CIMA certification follows a very natural progression. So since I would say we're in module four, it's gotta be based on all of this performance measurement must be based on stuff prior to it. And a lot of it's based on this statistics and this portfolio theory. So I'll just give you a little taste. So for example, when we think about portfolio theory, right, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, the optimal risky portfolio, which is the market. And when we talk about the sharp ratio, the sharp ratio is the slope. It's the slope of this capital market line. It's called the sharp ratio. So what we're trying to figure out is how much return do we get per unit of risk? So you're going to learn how the performance measure comes back to the technical analysis. You will also learn that the slope of the security market line is the trainer ratio. You will learn that the difference between where you are where your return is and what the cap M says you should earn is called the Jensen's alpha. You will learn things like regression where your tracking error is the standard deviation of these distances from the line. So we'll bring you back so that you can understand what tracking error is. We will help you learn statistics and probability so that you can learn you know, things like value at risk and how do you explain value at risk. We will teach you how Sortino ratios are capturing you know, the effect of negatively skewed stock returns. So it's not the type of certification where you read stuff and you memorize it and then you take the exam and 90% pass. This is the type of certification where you learn the underlying material, you study for the exam, you practice, and then you take the exam, right? And if you don't pass the first time, you take it again, right? Um, until you do pass. So I've included in here, because I think they're gonna share these with you, some examples that you might wanna try to do to see if you can do them. Um, so for example, calculating trainer, Jensen, sharp and information ratios. I'll call that the information ratio. And see what you get. So for example, the trainer ratio. It's the return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by beta. The sharp ratio is the return on the portfolio minus the risk-free rate divided by standard deviation, right? The information ratio is your alpha, which is the 20% minus 3 plus 1.8 times 11 minus 3 over your tracking error. So you'll learn to do that and think about what they are. And then briefly, the last thing that I wanted to talk about was this idea of attribution. And remember, attribution is, did we earn the return worse or better because of asset allocation or security selection? So just looking at this, not knowing very much, we earned one, our bogey or our benchmark earned two, so we're down by 1%. And then the question is why? So just looking at it, you can tell. We had 20% in bonds when bonds were doing well. The market or our benchmark had 50%. We put 80% and 
in something that was doing poorly. But at least as poorly as it was, we didn't do as bad as the market. So what you would find here is that we were, we did 1.8% worse because of asset allocation. Wrong place, wrong time. But we're going to do a little bit better because of security selection. So at least our securities weren't losing money. And then so overall, minus 1%. So this is the idea of attribution. So to close, um, why do we do these things? To assess the investment approach, suggest changes to improve the approach, communicate the results, and compensate management. Now, I forgot that I had to do this, so I'm literally only going to take 30 seconds. I just want to tell you uh, oh, one other thing. You don't have to memorize this stuff. It's all in the formula sheet. You need to learn how to use the formula sheet. It's one of your best friends, just like the other uh, document that I talked to you about, the code. So if you do come to Booth, I just want to put in a plug for Booth. Um, Booth is a little bit different than the other ones. Yale's online. Um, very good if you want to do all online. A Wharton is live. Very good if you want to be live. Um, Booth, we do a hybrid approach. We're going to deliver it over three months. It's it's I'm kind of a bossy person. It's a little bit um, um, I would say regimented in what we do. So over three months, we have stuff that we need to do every week. Certain meetings. We have lectures to watch. We've got weekly review sessions. We've got practice problems, quizzes, etc. We finish one week. We move to the next week. So it's a very structured schedule. Lots of practice problems, lots of feedback. I like the cohort approach. Uh, you're with the same people all the time. You get to know them online and otherwise people form study groups. Um, we do our very best to like bring live into online. And we've got uh, a very good selection of faculty and practitioners that can bring um, you know, this material to life for you and help you understand what's going on. Um, our participants, here's one, you can get more of these from Rebecca Meyer. Um, I'm sure that if you just look for Booth online, Rebecca can give you lots of different um, recommendations from people. Uh, you can always ask me questions if you have questions. I'll be completely honest with you. If you are like, if you don't, if you can't decide, you know, what type of program am I looking for? I, I am more concerned that um, you pick the right program for you, then you are, then you come into Booth. Of course, I want you at Booth. Um, I'd be very happy for you to be here, but you know, this is a major investment and you should pick the program that works best for you because what works best for you is going to work best for everyone around you, including your clients. Okay, Mike, thank you very much, by the way. I think we're going to answer questions now. Is that correct, Mike? Yeah, thank you. So we'll have a, a, a little bit of information that I'll share with the group um, so that they have that information uh, for moving forward. Um, and then we'll be able to uh, uh, finish with answering any questions. So I'll pull up um, the presentation here and answer or walk through a few things. And then uh, we'll be able to uh, open it up for questions. So certainly the steps to certification, where do you go from here? Right, that step one is is getting through uh, that full self-study program or any executive education as part of step two, and then ultimately um, the final certification exam um, that, that you see on the far right hand side, that 140 multiple choice questions at a testing center. It's a very last step in the process. Um, you can get ready if you're ready to go now, or if you're curious at how you would start if once you're ready, investmentsandwealth.org website is the first step of being able to apply uh, for the SEMA through IWI. And then after that, you can choose an education provider, which today we dug deep with Kathleen on the SEMA program through Chicago Booth was fantastic. All this again is on our website as far as walking through, um, submitting that application for the program, choosing an education provider, finishing your, your exam. You can see a little bit here on the examination uh, program, the format for that. There's, it talks about the calculator calculator policy. There are the four E's, right? Experience, ethics, education, examination that are all included for going through the SEMA process from start to finish. 
that three years of relevant experience, good ethics, completing the education program, and then completing all the requirements for an examination. And this is the fun part. This is what it looks like. I'll tell you, I finished my CMA in 2006, and I don't know if it was exactly like this on the outside, but internally, this is what my brain felt like. Finishing the SEBA program, if you've talked with anyone that has done it, is a fantastic feeling. So I know that uh, this is a lot of what it looks like. If you need help with getting through that, how do you, what's the structure look like? What are deadlines? How do we get started? Um, what's the best program for you? As Kathleen mentioned, um, we have Gray Bullard and Carrie Estes, our enrollment counselors that are part of the Investments in Wealth Institute team. You can see if you want to screenshot this, take a picture with your phone, you can see Gray and Carrie's contact information as well as my information here. We're going to be available the next 30 minutes or so if you want to call uh, and have live questions. We know that sometimes it's uh, it's questions on your your background, questions on how it would fit for you. So maybe it's not a question you want to pop into the question uh, screen here. Certainly this program is being recorded. So be able to watch, be able to walk through those slides and those examples that uh, Kathleen gave, which were fantastic. You'll have that recording. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our, our webinar today. If you have questions, feel free to type those into the question box. I know that so far the only one we had uh, was just a, a question on the recording. You will have access to recording where you can walk through and see those slides um, and see that information, but we'll take a minute or two. Uh, certainly some of the questions we get. Uh, Kathleen, share with us just a little bit. You mentioned that hybrid approach for the Chicago booth. One of the yeah. questions is, um, what is, what does that mean for hybrid? What's that experience look like? Okay, so um, thank you. I was rushing, and I forgot to tell you when the SEMA, the Booth SEMA program starts, and I'm going to get in trouble. So it starts in September 8th, um, and if, Rebecca can give you more information on that. But so the way that it works is the first four weeks, it's a 12-week program of, well, actually, it's more like a 16-week program. So the first four weeks, we walk through the foundations. Every week, every Wednesday night, we have class. And so we'll go through all the different foundations online. I'll do lots of practice problems and answer questions and illustrate all of the foundations that are in that first column um, or honeybee thing on the SEMA thing. Then the next eight weeks, we supplement those weekly sessions with on-demand lectures. And those will be from about eight other faculty. Um, and we will cover topic by topic the items that are on the handbook. Now, the lectures are, are it's designed to be an education program, not a certification exam program, um, prep program. It's more than a prep program. So it's, it's really what the on-demand lectures are, and they're a little bit different than what I'll do every Wednesday night, is they also give you additional knowledge that you can use in your practice that will help grow you as a practitioner. It may not be something that is on the certification exam, but it's certainly going to be something that is topical, relevant, and can help you, you know, expand your knowledge and expand your service, right? So I think, you know, well, I'm going to speak for IWI, and then Mike can correct me. Well, I'm sure they want you studying to learn to pass the exam. I think their goals are much broader than that. They're not just passing an exam. It's really about making you, you know, the best that you can be in the career that you chose. And I know it sounds a little bit rah-rah, but uh, I actually think it's true, true, right? I mean, this is exactly one of their goals. And I think if you talk to some of the counselors, they will also let you know that thing. So we've got the four weeks of foundations, the eight weeks of on-demand lectures, plus a weekly webinar in which we go through everything and all types of practice problems. Um, and then, the, after that, we've got a two-day live workshop in Chicago, which is designated just for exam prep. And that will actually take you to the certification exam. And then following that, we're going to have three or four practice problem-solving sessions that we uh, go through after the workshop, where we do a lot of practice problems. And we also purchase for all of our participants uh, Wiley Efficient Learning which is a database of about a thousand SEMA certification practice questions. Um, I think that's a, we just added that. Um, the reason that we added it is because it gives a lot of, you know, theoretical type questions, whereas at Booth we have a lot 
we do focus a lot on the math and the underlying understanding, but I think it needs to be complemented as well by some of these other questions. So that's a new thing that we've added to the Booth program. So I think it's it's uh, very valuable. I actually think it's a lot of fun doing those practice problems. Yeah, but, the, I thank you for mentioning the, the Wiley test prep as part of the curriculum. Yeah. That's a, a huge benefit and a huge bonus, and it's quite honestly very expensive to, to purchase that separately. So that's a thank you so much to Chicago Booth and the, the SEMA program that you guys run to make that available. I have access to the Wiley um, test prep program, and I've seen that firsthand, and they do a, a, a super nice job. Uh, I see here a question on how soon can we get started? Right, so you can actually go online today, um, complete the application, and and get ready for that September class that that she mentioned. I'm pulling up the the website right at Chicago Booth, and you can see uh, that upcoming date, that September 8th to December 3rd, uh, where once you complete your application uh, online for IWI, it allow you to sign up for a registration or an education program. You see offer, also over here on the the left hand side. Uh, Kathleen, I know you mentioned Re Rebecca Meyer and the team at Chicago Booth, the exec ed team. Here's the telephone number that 312 464 8732 number and exec.ed at Chicago Booth.edu. If there's questions there that you guys want to connect um, directly to those folks. Um, one of the questions, Kathleen, is what kind of study materials they receive if they go through the booth course. I think you touched on that pretty extensively. Anything that anything that we missed? Oh, it looks like yeah. you're typing in that question. You just typed yeah, in that answer there. Perfect. So that you get two online textbooks, uh, the Wiley uh, Body of Knowledge, Investor Body of Knowledge. It's, uh, it's a little bit out of date, but some of the chapters are excellent, so I like to recommend them. Um, they're directly related to the exam. You also get Bodie Kane and Marcus, which is the uh, one of the recommended books by IWI. You will get weekly materials, you'll have weekly quizzes, we have all different types of quizzes for you, and then of course you get the wildly efficient learning as well for some end of program practice as you gear up for the certification exam. Yeah. Perfect. I see a question here. If the company's paying for the program, what's the best process to do the payment? Great question. Um, you guys can choose uh, a couple of different options. So some folks, it's very simple that you pay for the program out of your own funds and then submit reimbursement. Um, other folks we've seen will actually have a, a company credit card um, where they can uh, just go online and use that credit card to or, or online payment uh, to process the payment. So there's some flexibility. Certainly, if you have questions or need to walk through that, you know the application portion at Investments and Wealth is the 995, and then the, the Chicago Booth program is separate. If you have questions on that, do you need to walk through that or have some uh, someone talk with your HR folks on that, please do um, connect with us. Um, I see Rebecca put her, her email in the chat, rebecca.meyer at chicagobooth.edu. Uh, if you have questions as well, that's in the chat box. Um, here's an interesting question that actually I don't believe I've ever had this question, so I love this. Is the course recommended for business owners? who plan to hire advisors to manage portfolios? So that's an interesting question. Um, I would say, depending on your involvement uh, and your level of sophistication, you know, thinking of your as an end client, um, certainly this is a heavy course. This is not designed to be a high level um, in the sense of a review. This is getting into the details. This is calculation using specific formulas, digging in deep as a practitioner or a professional would. So if you, certainly if you have that interest of going through the program, um, you know, learning those skills you would, I would say that, uh, you know, the typical client um, is less likely to need that depending on your level of wealth, depending on your level of involvement. Um, Kathleen, what are your thoughts there for a, a, an end client going through the SEMA program? Um, well, I mean, if you have the time, I. I'm a person that likes to take classes and take exams and get certification. So if you have the luxury of time and or, you know, it's a cost benefit analysis, right? In the end, um, it's going to cost you a couple hundred hours of time and probably $10,000 at least, right? So, but the return to you could be much higher. Um, I don't, I think that you'll be able to pass the exam. I don't know, Mike will know more about whether you'll actually be able to be certified without experience. Um, right. 
Yeah, good good point. Definitely, as far as using the certification itself or being accepted into the program, you would have to meet all the requirements. So if you had, um, you know, financial services background, if the business owner had some type of connection or financial services background that may allow you to to be uh, approved to to work through the program. Certainly, though, if there's um, other interests, um, I know from talking with the folks at, Ch at Chicago Boother Executive. Executive Ed Team, they have fantastic programs, and you see here on the screen this private wealth management program and some of these others for folks, this executive program for CFOs, executive finance program, you know, that may actually deliver on your needs better than a certification program where it gives you, you know, designed specifically for those uh, high net worth families um, and for individuals and clients, that actually may be a better fit um, than a certification program if we're thinking of that end client or end user. Um, so if that, that helps a lot or a little bit. Um, question we'll on certain... welcome him. If you want to come, we will definitely welcome you. Yeah. You, can, you can come take a class for 16 weeks and you will definitely learn a lot. You probably yeah, just won't. Yeah, you it's do have to meet the certification requirements by IWI though. Yeah, which I don't yeah. understand. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys so much for being a part of our program today. Certainly, there's a lot of questions. We love that. Uh, we know we went way over time. Thank you for hanging in there with us and staying along for the ride with us. Uh, if you have questions, again, uh, you know, reaching out to the Chicago, folks at Chicago Booth with Kathleen and Rebecca. If you want to reach out to, to us here at IWI, Gray and Carrie, we want definitely want to be good resources to you. If you if you don't reach out to us, there's a good chance we'll be calling and reaching out to you to, to say hello and connect and make sure we're doing a good job for you. Uh, so thank you guys so much, Kathleen. Thank you for your uh, participation today. We look forward to future webinars and today was just fantastic. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming. You guys come to the next ones too. We want you That's here. Right. Yeah. That's right, we got more ahead. Awesome. We've got more thank ahead. Chris in return, impact investing, lots of them, so yeah. That's right. That's right. All right. Thanks, Mike and, and Christina, for all of your help, and Rebecca, of course. And I'm going to class now. It's class in eight minutes. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Kathleen. Goodbye. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. Good luck.